Hello, everyone at Neuromatch 2.0. Very, very excited to be with you here. My name is Chris Rosell. I'm one of the organizers here at Neuromatch 2.0 from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and very pleased to have this session here, um, a partnership with the Growing Up in Science initiative. As you know, one of our main goals here at Neuromatch is to try and replicate some of the best parts of in-person traditional legacy meetings. And of course, in addition to the science, one of the best parts of those meetings are the personal interactions, the running into people in the hallway, the, the hearing, you know, sometimes the side stories of what's really going on in the lab or what's really happening with, with someone's career that they're not going to necessarily mention when they're up at the podium giving a talk. And so one of our efforts here to do that is this partnership with Growing Up in Science where we try and bring um, the real stories of people's careers um, kind of out into the open and talk about all the things that um, they have gone into people's trajectories that might not make it into the formal biosketch, but are just critical parts of how they become scientists, um, how they've developed their careers, and how they've, um, how they've achieved the success that they have. So I'm excited here today um, to be joined by Weiji Ma and Ann Churchland. Um, we'll get to both of them um, in series here. Um, Ann, of course, is at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. We'll get um, a formal introduction for her in a little bit as she tells her story. And um, we're going to start with Weiji Ma. Um, Weiji, I'm very excited um, to have here because he is the founder and organizer of the Growing Up in Science conversation series that he'll tell us a little bit about. For his formal biosketch, Weiji received his PhD in physics from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. He went on to do postdocs in computational neuroscience with Christoph Koch at Caltech and then Alex Pouget at the University of Rochester. And we heard from Alex earlier in a very lively debate about the role of Bayesianism in behavior. Weiji was an assistant professor of neuroscience at the Baylor College of Medicine from 2008 until 2013. And he's been at NYU since, where he's now a professor in neural science and psychology. And as I mentioned, in addition to his neuroscience researcher, he's the founder and organizer of the Growing Up in Science conversation series. It sounds like a nice, clean story when you read the bio sketch, but happy to turn it over to Weiji and to hear a little bit about the Growing Up in Science series and then about um, kind of his real story behind the bio sketch here. Thank you so much, Chris. It's really wonderful to be here. I've heard amazing things about uh, Neuromatch. Uh, it's stunning that to see that there are 3,100 people listening now. Um, I'm assuming that they're actually listening. You never know. Um, and um, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, this se session is going to be useful in some way in terms of uh, thinking about um, the stories behind uh, the scientists. Uh, so how Growing Up in Science started is uh, when I was speaking to my colleague, Christina Alberini, a neuroscientist at MIU, uh, in uh, 2013, around 2013-14. And uh, she actually, besides uh, being a neuroscientist, she is also a psychoanalyst in her spare time. And we were saying half jokingly that all scientists also need psychoanalysis. And uh, then we did, when we paused and we thought, well, is there maybe a way to provide some form of group therapy? Because uh, truth be told, if you go to uh, seminars there, like maybe 50 to 100 or, or so a year that you go to, and they're all about the science. Maybe occasionally you get a seminar that's about uh, career paths, um, but how often do you get to hear people speak about the personal side of their uh, career trajectory? And uh, from what I, uh, from my own experience, I had felt that this was actually a, a, a really a gap because students want to know um, that the feelings that they struggle with, that they are shared, um, all trainees, not just students, uh, postdocs, research assistants. And often there's this gap between uh, trainees and professors where it's felt that professors wouldn't um, be able to relate or it's been too long ago for them or they're just a different class of human being. Uh, so there's no point in uh, being open about feelings uh, towards um, towards faculty. Or there could be an intimidation factor that you are afraid that um, 
professors are going to judge you if you're going to be uh, talking about things that you struggle with. And, and the truth is, of course, that um, we, we're not that different, right? So professors ha have often also come through uh, windy, difficult paths. Sometimes they've taken detours. Uh, sometimes they had um, lots of uh, difficulties uh, in grad school or during their postdoc. That in can include uh, difficult situations with advisors or difficult lab situations or uh, difficulties balancing uh, work and life, feelings of I I imposter, or of being an imposter. Uh, we'll, we'll get to some of those in my own story. Um, but as I started work in science series at NYU, uh, it has proven to be uh, quite uh, uh, a game changer in terms of the atmosphere in the department. So people can actually talk more openly about these kinds of issues now with each other and perhaps even with their own advisors. Um, and uh, it, it's normalizing things, right? So if you feel, if you notice that everybody feels a certain way or many people feel a certain way, then uh, you, you might not feel as bad about yourself anymore. Uh, so uh, this has worked out well uh, for us since 2014. We have about one speaker a month at NYU. And it has also spread to other institutions. I'm, I'm very grateful to people who have science series in many, many other, other places. Uh, you can see the list on the website. Uh, if at any point you are interested in starting a similar series at your own institution, I'm always happy to help. There are some tips on, on the website. Um, but uh, I think that um, in, in every place where it's been tried, it, 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 it contributes to a more nourishing, a more supportive, more understanding environment department. And so we are really in the business of uh, the narratives, the personal stories uh, behind the science, right? So there's this branch called um, narrative medicines where doctors talk about uh, their personal experiences with patients and about how it relates to their own uh, thoughts and feelings. And we don't really have anything like that in science. Growing up in science uh, aims to be something like that. So. As you hear Anne's story and as you hear mine story, keep in mind this, this is just an N of two, right? This is not going to be a representative sample in any way. Every story is unique. Every story has its own twists and turns. Uh, and it's really about the first person experience here. It's not about uh, the statistics. Uh, and there might be things that you can relate to, things that you can completely not relate to. Um, we'd love to hear from you, All right? So. With that introduction, I, I'll start um, by telling my own story. So in a way, I was always meant to be a scientist, and in a way, I was never meant to be a scientist. So as I was growing up, I, I was living in uh, the Netherlands, um, a small town, uh, first uh, Appingedam, it's, it's, a small, it's a village, and then Groningen, which is a, it's a still a small town. Um, so my parents were, um, my grandparents were, had immigrated from uh, China, in the 1920s, so it was very early on, and I was one of the first third generation Chinese in, in the Netherlands. It was a very homogeneously white uh, community. So when I was in, uh, in high school, it was a school of maybe 450 students, and maybe there were five Asians, and two of them were my brothers. So uh, that, that, that's how much diversity I had there. I, I was also really weird in, in, in other ways. I uh, had skipped four grades in uh, primary school. Uh, and um, that means that I was four years younger than uh, the people around me. Uh, and that, that always made for a very difficult uh, growing up experience. Uh, I'm sorry, there is, uh, of course, right now, there is some heavy machinery operating outside the door. Um, so, uh, I was four years younger, and um, that means that I was sort of the the, the little kid in, cl in class, and people would um, often come to me and they uh, would talk to me as if I'm this, the next Einstein or I'm the next uh, a genius. And looking back, that really shaped me. So, I uh, one way in which it shaped me is that I uh, felt that I was just uh, somehow naturally gifted, and I had, didn't really have to do anything for to be successful. And um, now that I have a kid myself, I'm actually uh, really wary of that. I think that uh, can be a very, very um, unhealthy kind of environment to grow, grow up in. Um, so my mom was a, a tiger mom. So even though she had been born in, in Holland, she was 
uh, of the opinion that uh, great matter social life doesn't, right? So typical uh, East Asian uh, parenting style. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I, I was quite rebellious. So I was actually not, um, I was not uh, happy with that being, being treated that way. Nevertheless, I did well in school. Um, and uh, I w was interested in physics. Uh, I was actually more interested in Latin and Greek. So my grades, my final grades in Latin and Greek way higher than in physics. Uh, but I had a really uh, good experience where we went with a school team to a physics competition in Russia and it was very inspiring. So I decided to do study physics in college. So I, I decided to, uh, I, I went to college in my hometown, which is a pretty, um, a good university, it's the University of Groningen, uh, and uh, physics was um, fun for about half of my undergraduate uh, career, uh, because then I hit uh, courses like quantum mechanics, and uh, as much as I tried, I never quite understood quantum mechanics, I still don't. Um, and um, still I was being treated as a genius, and, and uh, this was also around the time that I actually couldn't really um, sail on those waves anymore. I actually had to work work for it, and that was uh, something I had I had to get used of to, and it was actually something I sort of was in denial for. I thought that everything should come easy to me. Uh, I did my undergraduate thesis with somebody who whom you would call a uh, dead wood nowadays. So it, it's somebody who had um, done good work in the seventies, nineteen seventies, and then um, pretty much hadn't done shit since, but had uh, gotten promoted just by virtue of growing older. That's how things go in, in Europe traditionally. And nowadays it's changing a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, so he was, he, he had this um, aura of like this old and wise professor and I looked up to him and I had um, nobody telling me, oh, you actually should, um, you should um, look into whether the, this person is actually as good as you think, uh, as you think he is. Um, so, uh, I did my undergraduate thesis with him, and then I made make an even bigger mistake. I decided to uh, stay on as his graduate student. So uh, the system in Europe was, and to some extent still is, that uh, you get accepted by one professor. You don't really take courses, so you're more like an employee than you're than you're a student. Uh, so I worked for this guy. I wanted to work on he was the hardest fields in physics. And it's, it was something that he actually didn't have much experience in. It was, he didn't have expertise in this. So what was I thinking? Uh, and uh, on top of that, another professor in the department had uh, sort of warned me against uh, joining this group and had said, well, maybe you should spread your wings, uh, uh, look at other countries, um, uh, look at programs in the US. He was American himself, um, but I didn't listen to him. Um, and uh, what's worse, I ratted on him. I told my advisor that this other guy had told me to look elsewhere and that, that was still one of the stupidest things i've done in my life did i mention that i didn't have any social skills um so i uh i i uh, joined my peach i i did i started grad school there it is a place that was uh, uh in many ways uh, really not good for me and uh, no wonder that uh, two years in i really had nothing to show for it uh, and I, I'm really not exaggerating here. So if you were to talk to people who uh, knew me from that time, I, I, I had struggled uh, and I hadn't really gotten help. Uh, my advisor uh, said, thought that everything I did was great, but that was because he really didn't, un didn't understand the field. Um, I uh, was in denial. I sort of had these delusions of grandeur that were probably fed by this um, my environment seeing me, myself me as a genius so I didn't even realize that things were not 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 going well um, and uh, at that point uh, I uh, started listening a little bit to people who uh, were starting to sound more and more urgent they're saying wait it's not going in the right direction and maybe you should do some changes so uh, I um, I eventually listened to them and I sought out a second advisor. Uh, so uh, now that I've, I've been on the other side for a long time, I've advised a lot of students who have to make a transition like that. So they either have to change labs or they have to find a second advisor. And it's, it can be a very difficult traumatic experience. But sometimes you see 
um, it's the only solution, but it's, it's really a last resort. Uh, like, uh, I hope that some of you have read this blog post that's called the top five traits of bad advisors. And right? if you haven't, you should look it up at some point. Uh, it's it's a good, um, it's, it's, a, it's a list of things that uh, advisors so uh, one thing is uh, being always uh, negative, uh, so being maddeningly inconsistent, um, um, being that good, like I already mentioned. Uh, what I often feel is uh, being never around. That's an important one. And uh, what I often see is that uh, students, they don't realize that sometimes uh, the fact that they didn't, didn't make any progress is, uh, is, is really due to poor mentorship. They uh, students have a tendency, not everybody, they have a tendency to find fault in themselves that they are not good enough and they must be doing something wrong. And sometimes it's actually good to um, uh, think also about the advisor. Like, is the advisor really doing their part? Are they are they being responsible? Are they a really good match with you? Uh, and and sometimes that that means that you have to uh, look look elsewhere. So I started working with this uh, much younger guy. Uh, somebody who was in uh, a different city in Holland and was actually working in this field. He was a string theorist, uh, really on top of his field. Um, great guy, personally. I, I went to his university maybe once or twice a week. Um, and then I realized that um, it was not just the advisor. It was also that the field was uh, too hard for me. Uh, so I don't know how many of you know uh, theoretical physics, but Modern theoretical physics, especially this field called string theory, is so theoretical that um, experiments are pretty much inconceivable. Right? There's just no way that you can do an experiment to test your theory. And um, as, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was in grad school, that was 96 to 2001, then people say, well, maybe in 30 years we, we, we would be that we would have testable predictions. Well, now we are 30 years further and still, still we're in the same boat. So it's that kind of field where most of your daily work is uh, doing abstract math. And uh, on the one hand, I felt that because people thought I was a genius, I, was, I should be able to do that. But then the reality was that I, I wasn't able to do that. I couldn't relate to that math. I couldn't do it myself. I was paired with another uh, grad school student who ha had um, a sort of an intuition for this very abstract math. And um, he was doing very well. And I, I was working beside him and trying to sort of catch up. I, I was sort of constantly trying to catch up. Papers uh, from my um, from grad school, both with this other grad student, and on each of those papers, he would do maybe 75% of the work. So as a, as a, a result of that, I felt that um, my, uh, my PhD was never my own, right? It, it's, a, it's a really bad feeling. I don't wish, wish that upon every, anyone in a better position than that. But I always felt that I, I had to catch up to understand what I was doing. And uh, this is where sort of my, my background and the reality really came uh, to a clash, right? Because on the one hand, I had this, uh, this inflated self-image. I thought very highly of myself because uh, my environment thought very highly of myself. Uh, but on the other hand, in my daily work, I was struggling. So how could I reconcile those things, right? And uh, later I learned that this is um, sort of a consequence of attributing ability to um, innate ability, right? So if things are um, like innate skills are innate uh, or innate abilities innate, then uh, when things go wrong, you start doubting yourself because it means that you're innately not as good as opposed to, well, maybe you haven't, uh, this is not the right match for you or maybe you haven't put in the work. Now, my way of coping, and I in, in those days, I didn't realize it was coping, is that I started doing a lot of extracurricular activities. That's insane if you think about it, right? My PhD wasn't going well, and I, I started spending most of my time doing uh, extracurriculars. That, that um, my roommate, my office mate in uh, my home university, um, he would disconnect the phone because I would be on the phone constantly um, for my extracurricular activities. Like I was. Uh, I was an organizer in a political youth organization. So I would organize debates. And of course, that involves a lot of phone calls. And he said, Weiji, what the fuck? I can't do my work because you're making all these phone calls. So that's how bad it got. I was active in an, uh, 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 like a bird watching organization, uh, e even though I didn't really care that much about bird watching, but it was another 
community, a place where I could belong, a place, place where I could, could still uh, derive some uh, self-esteem. Uh, so so uh, this, this was um, this went on. And uh, at this point, you probably ask, like, how did this guy ever get his PhD? That's a really good question. Um, pretty much the, the summary of how that went is that um, my advice is that, oh, okay, wait, you're now um, going into your fifth year. Um, uh, what what are your future plans? Are you hoping to continue in physics? And say, and I said, well, um, most likely I won't be continuing. I I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but no physics. And then he said, well, maybe you can defend them. And so uh, what what he was really saying is um, that um, that if I had continued in physics, it, it was would not have been enough. And that was and that was true. That was. Um, that was um, uh, like if I had wanted to continue in physics, I would have had to step up my game big time. Does Twitter count as bird watching? I like that. Um, so uh, I got my PhD. It was actually a media spectacle because at that time uh, I was the youngest PhD in the Netherlands. Uh, and this really exacerbated this contrast that uh, how, how I felt about how my PhD went myself. and. How the media portrayed me. So I had decided to not continue in physics. So what was I going to do then? So one thing I was considering was going into Dutch politics. But then people with more common sense they talked me out of that. Another thing I was considering was uh, going into business consulting. So I interviewed at McKinsey and uh, in Amsterdam. And one of the questions I got: Well, do you read the economics page of the newspaper every day? And I said, Not if I can help if I can help it. Uh, I didn't say that last part, but that was the truth, and that was that was not the right answer, right? Like the the interviewer said, "Well, you can work here. That's a really great uh, way to learn about development, about stocks and mergers." And, and then that was the moment that I decided, "Well, maybe that's not that's not for me." And as it happens, my mom had been interested in psychology. And uh, so I had sort of grown up with that, so, sort of at a, at a very popular level. So she would read popular psych uh, magazines and maybe saw that stuck. And when I was in grad school, I had um, attended some uh, psych psychology um, talks, right? So mostly public talks, but then also uh, some scientific talks. So I remember in one talk in particular, it was a Dutch psychonomic. And um, that's uh, that's this amazing uh, illusion. And when I saw it in this talk, I was completely blown away. And the second thing I was blown away by is that uh, somebody could make a living studying that kind of thing. Um, because uh, as a physicist, and this is all of physics, right? The uh, the traditional way of thinking is that physics is, is at the pyramid of all scientists, right? sciences, and then. Chemistry is applied, applied physics, biology is applied chemistry, and, and neuroscience and psychology, that, that would barely exist. It would be uh, dwelling in, in, in the basement with the rats. Um, so uh, I, I, as a physicist, that took a lot of um, sort of self-conviction or like a self persuasion to realize that actually studying the brain is super interesting and, and behavior is super interesting, and maybe I can make that a career. Uh, so the transition was made easier because I had been in the media, so I could get a postdoc fellowship to study abroad, even though my PhD hadn't been anything special. And because it, that was the early days of computational neuroscientists, night science, and there were all these opportunities for physicists to enter computational neuroscience. So I, I entered this field literally with the idea that I would give science one more chance. Right? And I was skeptical because of my experience in physics. And then I uh, just wanted to give this one more try before I tried something completely else. So I was actually quite close to dropping out at that point. And 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 very often I actually uh, see now students who uh, actually drop out. Um, and sometimes it's because of really negative or toxic experiences that they might have had in their subfield or in their lab or with their advisor. And I always uh, ask, uh, how sure are you that uh, it, 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 it isn't better elsewhere, right? So maybe it's 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 the specific set of circumstances that you were in that um, that make you miserable, and maybe it's not science uh, per se. So 
I joined the lab of Christoph Koch uh, at, um, at Caltech. So Christoph was a former physicist himself and had moved into consciousness. Now that appealed to me because uh, I hadn't lost my delusions of grandeur. So if I couldn't solve the mysteries of the universe, I was going to solve the mysteries of consciousness. And uh, I, uh, I joined the lab in uh, large part because Christoph had, was scientifically studying consciousness. And he did that, did that in very rigorous ways. So it was it, it was not just uh, talking. It was doing rigorous uh, experiments, usually on visual awareness. Um, uh, he was talking a lot to Francis Crick about it. He wrote a book about it. So he was um, he was he was serious about this endeavor. Uh, Christoph is also a very creative person. Uh, he had an, a lab with amazing people. Um, but I also noticed that um, his mentorship style was not for me. So um, this uh, was because his, he was already quite well known, traveling a lot, and he had a, had a huge lab. It was something like 10 grad students and 10 postdocs. And that means that it was a more or less hierarchical structure where grad students would talk to postdocs. I was a postdoc, but technically, like, but in practice, still a, a, a grad student because I was switching fields. And uh, that means that uh, we, we had to be independent. We had to find our own way. And that worked well for some people, uh, but it didn't work for me because um, I already sort of alluded to me being a, a big procrastinator. And this uh, really became a big issue during my first postdoc. So uh, I, I would play a lot of time, a lot of, spend a lot of time playing online chess. And uh, that, that had already started in grad school. And I, I spent like, Something like um, six thousand hours on this this one chess server that that actually kept track of how, how many hours you spent, and it was also the first time that I was living away from my mom and I was living in LA. So I had and I had uh, a lot of catching up to do in terms of uh, social life, right? So I would try to go to uh, clubs in, in in Beverly Hills or in Hollywood or spend time on Santa Monica, uh, Venice Beach, um, maybe a little bit more than was um, was let's say advisable for somebody who wants to make a career uh, in, in science. So uh, if you look at my publication record for my first postdoc, it's actually really um, unimpressive. So I have one book chapter with Christoph, zero, zero papers, one book chapter. So this is a matter of record. And um, what happened is that uh, after two years, money had run out and Christoph pretty much says, uh, what have you been doing in my lab? And I, I really had not much to show for it. So then he said, well, you got two months and then you're out of here. So I was being kicked out of the lab. And that was completely justified because I honestly was not doing anything remotely up to par at that, at that stage. I, I had some saving graces. So I, I had started as a procrastin procrastination project uh, I had started working with Patrick Wilkin, who was an, another postdoc in the lab, who had an experimental psychology background. He had some data on uh, visual working memory that he was sitting on, and he wanted a modeler to collaborate with. Uh, and I said, okay, I can do math. Let me uh, work work with him. And that was actually great because he, he was always around. I could talk to him. I learned a lot from him. It was a, a fruitful collaboration. I didn't think much of the paper that came out of it. It was a journal vision paper, but later much later that actually became the foundation of uh, an entire line of work in my lab so um sometimes that happens that uh, things things come back much later but yeah so uh, that was one saving grace i had a similar collaboration with ladan shams and now at ucla um uh, and that's how my interest in Beijing inference got started um but uh, neither of these was uh, uh, was with christoph now the other piece of luck that i had had and and really are not uh, planned uh, careers might be planned to some extent but but plans fall apart plans fail in all kinds of ways and luck plays an, an immense role uh, and uh, the way that luck played a role for me was that uh, it must have been like the end of 2013 when Alex Bouget came to give a talk at um, at Caltech and he uh, spoke about his work and he spoke with me in a one-on-one -on -one meeting and I asked him this question about like uh, how do neurons uh, uh, encode probabilities I've, I've read this in your paper and I've read this in other papers and I really cannot make sense of it and he said something along the lines of 
you know what, uh, even though I write papers about it, I'm not quite so sure, quite sure. I think it's a really hard problem. I think the, the field hasn't figured that out. And that was the, the kind of humility that was incredibly refreshing to me, especially given that he was French. Um, I, I hope I didn't offend too many people there. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, then uh, uh, Alex took a chance on me. So he said, uh, why don't you join me in Rochester? And uh, that he did that in spite of uh, me having spoken with you. Um, that was um, my, so I did my second postdoc for four years with Alex in Rochester. Um, in one way, that was not a great time because after all, it was in Rochester, um, which uh, was not exactly my kind of town. I'm more of a big city person, um, and uh, this is a place that is a bit in the middle of nowhere and very suburban <laughs> feel, and it snows six months a year. So uh, uh, personally, it was not uh, the best period of my life, let's say that way. But professionally, this was actually really good because Alex ran a very different operation. So he had a very small lab, maybe four or five people max. And uh, he, know, he knew exactly what we were doing. Not only that, he would meet with us frequently. So that he would and say, uh, hey, I thought about it last night and I had this idea. Uh, uh, do you have uh, time this afternoon to meet about this? Right? So that was new to me that uh, an advisor would actually uh, bring in, uh, constantly bring in ideas themselves and, uh, and request meetings. That was sort of the opposite. Um, uh, it's a diff very different kind of model than, what, than what, what I was used to. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that I, it didn't mean that I didn't try procrastinating. So uh, I remember that maybe three months in, uh, into my second postdoc, I was procrastinating and done very much. And then Alex pretty much asked me, what the fuck have you been doing these past, past months? And I didn't have much to show for it. And then he said, you better get your act together because this is your career, not mine. If you if you want to make it in this field, you um, you have to just st uh, like work harder, and and that that was the kind of wake up call that I needed, and I, I did that to some extent. So it was a it was professionally a really really good time. Uh, it didn't um, I, I was still doing other things like I, I still um, uh, started non a non profit organization while I was a postdoc in Rochester. This is a rural China education foundation. Um, it still exists, um, and uh, it, it was not. Uh, I, I'm sort of. Um, it was half a procrastination, but it's also because I've, from from a young age on, I've already really cared deeply about social justice and about environment and ed education. So I have always wanted to be active in social causes. So I've always felt that um, I had sort of a, a split existence, and that's the part that I meant where I I, I never felt that I was meant to be a scientist because. I, I know that some scientists they all they live for their science. I'm I'm not like that. I always felt um, like having two people inside myself and um, and living in two different worlds. And sometimes I would even sort of be looked down a little bit on people who live only for their science, because I felt that I had this other rich part of my life. Uh, I'm a, I'm a little bit more mature now, I hope, but uh, I, I I still think that maintaining. Uh, something that you care really about, deeply about, especially if it's societally relevant, is is important and it, sh it should be possible. And uh, you can create a space for yourself where that is possible. Um, now, uh, something else that happened during my first, second postdoc was uh, uh, imposter complex uh, re hit really hard. So I was work working next to Jeff Beck, a uh, uh, really amazing postdoc at the time. He's now at Duke. And he had, um, again, a natural intuition for math. He had come from applied math. This was his first postdoc. And he was amazing. He would come up with these ideas that we would consider a visionary um, uh, much later, but we didn't understand at the time. And uh, I was sort of follow what he was doing. And uh, uh, and that, that made me feel inferior. I was saying, well, I have this background in theoretical physics. I should be able to do this, uh, this as well. Um, and uh, and later I learned that it would be a big mistake to judge people just by math ability because you can succeed along many different dimensions and uh, there are uh, uh, there were things that Jeff was better at the math but there were things that I was better at for example uh, presenting the math to uh, 
uh, non-computational audiences. And uh, that actually turns out to be the more, in, in, uh, the more critical skill when you go on the job market, if you can explain math to uh, um, audiences that don't know math. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that, that was when I started uh, these, uh, feeling these very strong imposter feelings. Um, then uh, I, I got my first faculty job at Baylor College of Medicine because somebody gave me a chance again. So uh, Reed Montague was my big advocate at, uh, there. Uh, I had some good papers for my second postdoc, but overall my record was not the strongest, right? Given my first postdoc in, in, in grad school. So he gave me a chance. Uh, Mike Friedlander, the chair, gave me a chance, but it was absolutely clear that, that this was based on um, what they perceived as promise rather than accomplishment. And um, that that was a big transition. So many PIs, they feel sort of thrown in, into the deep because uh, you, you don't get trained in, in mentorship. You don't train, get trained in teaching usually. Um, so I, we, we have to figure those things uh, out ourselves. Uh, what's really hard is uh, trying to figure out how to hire people. And uh, strange, but yeah, you, you look at CVs, and uh, you, I didn't realize that you should do much more than look at CVs. You should really look at personal chemistry and like depth of motivation. And it took me a long time before I realized that. But I was also lucky to have some really amazing people. Um, and I, um, uh, I was productive in my um, in my first five years. I, in my fourth year, I started applying to uh, other places, and this was to uh, solve a two-body problem uh, in part. So uh, my wife and I had met in 2006, and um, we had at that point, no, sorry, not at that point, even uh, taken overall, we had have been apart for, um, in, uh, we, we were apart for eight out of nine uh, out of the first nine years that we knew each other. So constantly long distance. So Rochester, New York, then um, uh, uh, then uh, Houston to Philadelphia uh, for, for many years. Uh, I don't know who is also in um, in, in in that boat, but uh, yeah, you, you try to make it work. You see the silver lining. You don't you can live like a bachelor. You can, don't have to clean up after yourself. Those kind of things. But in, in the end, it still sucks and. Uh, I don't know, looking back, if I would have made the same choices. But um, she wanted to stay on the East Coast. She was a medical doctor. Her parents uh, were in New Jersey. And uh, I uh, was starting to, starting to look at the, on the East Coast. In addition, NYU was also a better match to me um, intellectually because of a stronger focus on, uh, on computational neuroscience and computational cognitive science. So um, I, I, I moved in 2013. I've been very happy. Um, and uh, at a personal level, some things have uh, uh, have gone away, right? So imposter complex has pretty much gone away. It went away the moment I uh, was hired by NYU because at Baylor College of Medicine, I could still tell myself, well, uh, the focus of, of Baylor is on uh, molecular and cellular and translational neuroscience. So maybe they don't realize that I'm actually not a good uh, computational neuroscientist. At, uh, I knew that was a harder case to make. So it was, it's very strange that I had to get this external uh, stamp of approval to um, lose my imposter feelings. One thing that I still hasn't gone away is uh, procrastination. It's really, really bad. Just ask my students. So uh, I, I um, write grants in the past few days. I finish them in the past few hours before a deadline. Um, I have a deadline tomorrow to review seven NIH grants. I, I have, have barely started with the first one right now don't tell uh, the study section um it's really bad i i still have nights that i play online uh, chess uh, or dominion until 3 a.m and then i have to get up and be functional uh, the next morning so um if you have any tips to deal with procrastination i've tried pretty much everything please let me know um and then yes i have also started to take up more of this um uh, mentorship role as well as uh, doing more outreach and and now is also the sort of the, the first time in my career that I feel that the, these two branches of my life they started to come together. And people listen to you even if it has nothing to do with your area of expertise. That's you can think of that what you want, but you can also um, uh, uh, sort of um, make good use of that uh, by out about causes that you care about. So 
uh, one thing that we started this organization called Scientist Action and Advocacy Network. This is a group of scientists, uh, mostly New York based, where uh, we do organization, um, literature reviews um, uh, for nonprofit organizations that work in areas of criminal justice, juvenile justice, and, and environment. That's great. Weiji, I have lost your video a little. Okay. Um, can but are you still there? I can hear you. There, now I can see you. Weiji, can you hear me okay? Weiji, one more chance here. Can you hear me or have we been disconnected? Okay. Seem to have lost Weiji's audio and video. That was fantastic. Um, Anne, can you just confirm, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you fine. I think um, I think we lost Weiji, but I think he maybe said almost everything he wanted to. Yeah, I think so too. That was really, really fantastic. And I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat about just, uh, just being so grateful for the honesty um, of, the, of the comments there. So that's fantastic. Um, I think there were some comments, but maybe we can, uh, or questions, but we can maybe save those um, for the end here. I can say I'm just particularly grateful to hear that. You know, I'm first generation to go to college in my family. I almost left grad school in the middle because I felt like I was failing. And the whole way through, I felt like there was some language or some culture that I didn't understand. And if I would have had a chance to hear stories like this, from people who um, were actually experiencing some failure and willing to talk about it, um, that would have made just a world of difference for me. So I am I am so, so grateful um, that Wei Ji has started this series and, and talks about it so openly. So we'll try and get Wei Ji um, connected here for a Q&A session at the end. Um, in the meantime, um, I would love to be able to hear the story of Anne and her growing up in science. So Anne Churchland received a PhD in neuroscience from UCSF. It was based on her work studying motion processing and eye movements in macaque monkeys. She worked under the supervision of Steve Lisberger. She was subsequently a postdoctoral fellow with Mike Shadland at the University of Washington at the time and studying decision-making in non-human primates. Next, she became an assistant professor at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York and started a research group focusing on multisensory decision-making in rodents. Her research in this topic has implicated both cortical and subcortical circuits and the computations that support these decisions. She also discovered that even the brains of expert decision-makers are often dominated by signals unrelated to the decision at hand, such as idiosyncratic fidgets. Um, her bio that I have lists her as an associate professor, but do I remember seeing on Twitter <laughs> that you've been promoted to professor at? Yes, I'm Harvard. a professor, yes. Fantastic Thank news. <laughs> and neuroscience chair at Cold Spring yes. Harbor. And of course, many of us um, know Anne, in addition to her science, for her role co-organizing many conferences, including cosine and canonical computations in brain and machines. Also, in addition to her neuroscience research, she's the founder of AnsList.net, which highlights female neuroscientists. So, Anne, just thrilled to have you here. We would love to hear your story of growing up in science. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. Can everybody uh, hear me okay? Sound is all right? Okay. I can hear you. Chris so can hear me. Okay, we'll I think if the, we'll hear in the comments that people cannot hear me, so I'll, I'll keep going. Um, okay, yeah, so so thank you very much to Chris Rosell and also to all of his um, many co-organizers for 
um, putting together this fantastic event. I think this is incredible to be able to do this during uh, the pandemic. And I think it has many advantages over traditional conferences, such as availability to many, many people all around the world. So this is awesome. And, and thank you so much for including me. Um, I also feel really honored to be um, part of this program alongside Weiji Ma, whose leadership in growing in, up in science has been really transformative for the field. Um, I also really enjoyed hearing his personal story. Um, and and there, there's an interesting feature here. I, I think of Weiji and I as being um, two people who, who think rather similarly. We're sort of excited about a lot of the same scientific problems. We share a number of collaborators. I've been a longtime fan of his work. Um, but interestingly, I think we came to this point of intellectual coalescence um, despite really, really different experiences growing up. Um, so uh, anyway, hopefully my story will be an interesting uh, counterpoint um, to Weiji's. Um, so I guess just to start off, um, I really did. Uh, I, I really did grow up in science, actually. Um, as many of you probably know, both my parents were philosophers, um, and they were really enthusiastic about the brain. Um, when I was little, we lived in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is a very um, pretty cold city in central Canada. Um, they uh, are not from there. They're from the west coast of Canada, from British Columbia, but um, they went to University of Manitoba because it was the only place um, that they would that they could get jobs, specifically the only place that would hire my mom. Um, so off they went to University of Manitoba, and, uh, and and it was a pretty great place to grow up, actually. I think um, my experience as a child was really different from Weiji's. I think my mom was not at all a, a tiger mom, and that's partly because she was really busy um, writing books and thinking about the brain, and, and also because I think she grew up in a farming family in, in which I don't think it really was a belief that investing massive effort in the details of parenting was a particularly good idea. Um, and you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't think we're all trying to figure that out. Um, but as a result, I, I had a pretty free childhood. We played outside a lot, went on canoe trips. Um, I spent a lot of time playing board games with my brother, um, some of whom you know. Um, I'm pretty sure that nobody considered us to be geniuses uh, at all. And this was a, a totally appropriate conclusion. <laughs> because we really were not. Um, so uh, we, we lived in Winnipeg for a while, um, and then we moved to Southern California. My parents got jobs at, uh, at UCSD. Um, so I lived in, in San Diego for a while uh, and had kind of mixed feelings about that. So when I was deciding where to go to, for undergrad, I decided I would fly across the country um, and go to school uh, outside of Boston. Uh, I went to a women's college. I went to Wellesley College, which was a pretty cool experience to have, I think, especially at that time of life. I, I had really noticed through some experiences that I had had as a high school student that the way that women participate in a dialogue is really, really different when there were only women in the room. And I really wanted the opportunity to be taking the math and science and psychology classes um, in, an, in an environment where I felt like I could have a strong voice and other women would have a strong voice um, as well. And uh, so that, that, was a really, um, that was a really great uh, experience. Um, and when I finished my undergrad, I didn't really know, I didn't have a clear sense of what I wanted to do. Um, I had taken some classes at, um, at MIT in neuroscience, which were great. I really, really liked them. But I didn't really have any like clear enough vision that made me want to apply for graduate school. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, but I heard about a job as a technician in, uh, at UCSF in the lab of um, Steve Lisberger, who works on uh, ocular motor functioning. Uh, and, and how we move the eyes around and, and stabilize images on the retina uh, and so on. Um, and I kind of went there just because it was a good job. Like it seemed like it'd be cool to move to San Francisco. My roommate from college was willing to move with me. We just got in my little Dodge Colt and drive, drove across the country um, and, uh, and uh, I got, got a job there. So it, it was a huge transition um, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, some of them scientific, of course, but also the experience of being at a really major medical center after coming from a small um, women's liberal arts college was, um, was jarring. It was really different. And I realized that this experience of, of having been at a women's college kind of gave me some, some priors that were quite incorrect uh, about the world. So, so some of them were helpful. Some of them were just rather arbitrary. So when I, when I was an undergraduate, I was quite enthusiastic about rowing. I was on the rowing team and, and had, as a result of this, for the first time in my life, spent a certain amount of time in the weight room with the other people on the rowing team and, you know, and other sports teams as well, I suppose, all of whom, of course, were women. So I went off to UCSF, and one day my, um, uh, my office mate, who was Nicholas Preeby, who some of you might know, said, oh, well, let's go. We'll go to the weight room tonight at UCSF. And I thought, okay, great. 
So off we went and I walked into the weight room and immediately I was very taken aback because the weight room was full of men. And I thought, oh gosh, I didn't even know, I hadn't thought of men as participating in this activity at all. <laughs> Which of course is totally the wrong prior. Um, but uh, having been at a women's college, I just it, it, I was just used to only seeing women, you know, lifting up the doing the bench press and picking up, up the weights and so on. But there were other kinds of priors that were not just silly. Uh, they were really useful. And and one of them is that I really um, it really felt wrong to me to be in a seminar or any kind of dialogue and to not hear any women speaking. I was used to the conversations having women's voices as part of them. And and so this this would just it would stick out at me like a sore thumb and so i i it would frustrate me and i think well there's got to be at least one woman saying something so um so i i guess i'll have to ask a question um and and this turned out to be a really great thing actually because it got me in the habit of sitting in a talk and planning to ask a question in the talk and whether you have a feminist agenda or not um, i would highly recommend that you take this point of view in a talk it really changes the way that you hear the talk and it also will help you get over that hump of worrying that you're asking a bad question um, people say that there are no bad questions um, but there actually really are bad questions that i know because i asked a lot of them, a lot of really dumb questions but the dumb questions you ask those are part of your path to be asking really good questions so just get those bad questions out of the way. Ask them. Don't worry if they're bad. I promise you nobody will even remember the bad question that you asked. Um, and, and I think that experience um, really helped me to, to, to realize that I could be part of the scientific dialogue of whatever, um, of whatever talk or seminar I was in. So I think that was a really, that was a bias, uh, a prior about the world that I brought with me that really helped me um, to do something that was, um, that was useful. So I ended up staying, uh, staying on in the, in the lab and, um, uh, and becoming a graduate student in the same lab where I was a technician. Um, and, and overall, the challenges I faced during that time were, were small to, compared to some of the ones that I faced um, later in life. I, I certainly faced some. Um, it was a program in neuroscience at UCSF, which was part of the program in biological sciences. And I, I really didn't have the biology background that I needed for that course. And I really, really struggled. I almost failed the cell biology class and had to go in for remedial help and ask like so many dumb questions. Um, uh, but eventually I really stuck with it and I, I got my friends to help me out a lot. You know, having having friends that you feel comfortable with kind of acknowledging that you're a real novice in a subject can be very, very helpful. Um, and I'm really grateful to the people during that time um, that, that helped me struggle through, uh, you know, learning the details of the plasma membrane um, for the first time. I think one of, one of the, the um, characteristics that I think really defined my time in grad school um, and maybe maybe even today is something that's really a double edged sword. And again, this is kind of a counterpoint to what Weiji talked about. Um, which is that during that time, I was super, super laser focused. Like I would get a problem and I just wanted to work on that problem. And if I was going to write a proposal for like, you know, the National Science Foundation grant or my essay for grad school, it was like going to be a really detailed description of what I would be doing for the next five weeks, like to have <laughs> the analysis, like super, super focused. And in some ways, that was a really helpful, um, that can be a really helpful quality. Uh, it, it meant that I was really able to hone in on the projects that I was working on and make um, uh, uh, make a lot of progress on those questions. Um, but there also is a flip side to that. And, and I think, you know, this is true of all personality traits, which is that it was really hard for me to see the big picture. Um, I was not someone who had much of an appreciation for the big questions. I wasn't that interested in big questions. Um, when it was time to, to spell out any kind of larger vision, even a vision that was appropriate for the scope of you know NSF research proposal, I really, really, really struggled to do it, to kind of step beyond the analyses and experiments that I was doing at the moment and see what the kind of, what, what the bigger, the important bigger questions were. Um, but I think as a, as a student, I was able to kind of um, struggle along uh, with that shortcoming uh, without too much trouble because um, it's not at, at the level of a student. I think that that can be helpful, a helpful quality, despite its, um, its accompanying downsides. So um, at the uh, end of grad school, um, I had a child. Uh, and then I left San Francisco almost immediately to do um, a postdoc in Seattle. And um, this was a much more challenging time of my life. Um, uh, I moved to a city where I didn't know anyone, where I had, you know, adequate financial resources, but, but 
you know, not not the financial resources that people have later in their career that give them flexibility in selecting childcare, for instance. Um, I had a small child that I had to take care of all alone. I've never been a parent before. And even though I was so thrilled to be a parent, it was a really new thing for me. Um, and one thing that was, I think, really challenging for me during that time is that uh, People saw me really, really differently when I was a postdoc than they had as a student. And I don't totally know why. I think my hypothesis is that it had something to do with the fact that like a mom with a new baby is not really our image of when we think of a scientist. But um, for for whatever reason, this happened and it it just sucked. Like when I was a student, like I was the one, like if the PI was out of town and like something broke, he would like call me up and be like, and you got to fix this. And I'd go fix this. Or like if people, I remember the postdoc I shared a, um, a rig with, he used to tell me, he'd like, he'd say, okay, the rule in the lab is if something breaks, you should try to fix it. But if you try and try and try and try and you still can't fix it, go get Ansh fix it. Like I was the person that, that everybody believed in. And then all of a sudden, I don't really know why, like no one really believed me anymore. They didn't believe in me. They didn't believe the things I said. And people would ask me technical questions like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do some microstimulation. And I would like give some specific details. Oh, remember, you know, the pulse should be shaped like this. And at this point, like I was really, I'd written a lot of papers <laughs> about like monkey physiology, which is the lab I was in. I knew my shit, but people would be like, no, Anne, why would you do that? And I'd be like, well, I don't know, but I, you know, I have a paper on this, just do it this way. And then they'd come back like three weeks later and they'd be like, yeah, okay, you were right. Actually, we didn't need to do it that way. But it, it really sucked. And I think um, it made me realize how valuable it is to have people that have intellectual respect for you. And when suddenly that is lessened, it's, it's very painful. And it's, very, it's a very hard hole to climb out of. Because once people stop believing in you, they don't usually change their mind. It's really hard to change people's minds. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, but so what do you do? Like, what, what, you know, when you find yourself in a postdoc, you know, it's, it's going okay. But, you know, if there were, like I said, these negatives. What, do you, what does one do in that situation? Well, I, I guess the things that I did, I don't know what one should do. I'll tell you what I did do. Um, I think that the first thing to do is to focus on what's good. And some of that will be scientific, scientific, right? Even if your own project is kind of at a low point, you know, maybe you write a paper that you're excited about. Maybe you have a, you know, a, a collaborator, a collaboration um, uh, that's fun, a collaborator that you like to talk to. Um, I think in my case too, uh, I, I did have a few things like that. There were some collaborations I really liked, you know, exciting talks that I went to um, that were great. Um, the other thing that was good about that time um, was that I had, I then had another child two years later. So I had two small children, which was super challenging in terms of figuring out how to get work done and so on, but also super gratifying. Like I loved being a parent and they were wonderful and, and I could kind of come home and forget about the challenges of the day when I would sit down on the floor with them and play with Play-Doh or read books or, or have a good time. Um, so I think that the first thing I did that was, that was maybe good was um, to, to focus on what's good. Uh, the other thing I did is to really rely on my friends at that time. Uh, I had a couple of good friends. One of them was uh, was the random person who happened to live next door to me, who was just wonderful and positive and nice. Um, the other, uh, I had a few uh, uh, friends, developed some friendships at the university, one with Adrian Fairhall that was really, really transformative. Um, and, you know, when you're going through these difficult times, you get together with someone at the end of the week, they pour you a glass of wine, they say, Anne, I don't know why no one thinks you're smart. You really are smart. Stick with it. Don't give up. And uh, and and hearing those things from from her were um, were really transformative, and I think really helped me get through that um, really difficult time. So the last thing I decided to do was to try and get a job, because as I mentioned before, if if there is a group of people that don't believe in you, there's this strong temptation to try to change their mind. Right, to convince them that even though they think you're just okay, that actually you're really, really great and you, you'll just convince them of that. But really that is a bad strategy. If there are people in your world that don't believe in you and don't think you're good, just find new people, <laughs> just roll the dice again. And so I thought, all right, I'm gonna go try to find a job. And I had a K99, I had a nature neuroscience paper and a neuron paper from my postdoc. I had a ton of paper, I had a really great publication record, great grant track record. And then I just crashed and burned on the job market big time. I was trying to get a job to open a primate lab for um, two or three years, depending on how you count. And um, 
Part of it was bad luck. Uh, the, the economy was going through a big downturn at that point. I remember landing um, in San Diego to interview for my dream job at UCSD. And the, when I turned on my phone, when the plane landed, the governor of California had declared a hiring freeze. So that was the end of that position. Uh, I applied for a position uh, at Stony Brook to open a primate lab, and then they decided to end their primate program. <laughs> a lot of it was just really bad luck, um, but some of it wasn't. I think, you know, I, I don't really know. For whatever reason, I was not, despite having, I think, a really strong track record, I was not at all competitive um, on the job market at all. And it, it was really soul-destroying and soul-crushing and sad for um, quite a while. Um, because my dream had been to open a primate lab and to, I had a K99 to do it. And I had like years of experience. Like I was just the right person to do it. Um, but then an interesting thing happened. So, so I was on my way to give a job interview at Stony Brook before they closed their primate program the next week. And on my way to Stony Brook, um, some folks at Cold Spring Harbor of uh, Tony Zader and Florin Albino, a few others had invited me to come and give, um, give a seminar. So I went and gave the seminar and they, they liked the seminar. And afterwards they said, you know, this is great, but you should think about doing this work using a rodent model because they'll have much more powerful tools for really dissecting the circuit, figuring out how evidence is accumulated and so on. This is what I was interested in at the time. And I was like, no, you guys, you know, that'll never work. You know, these animals aren't smart enough. And, and, but they, they pushed back. They said, well, you know, how do you know? You haven't really tested this directly. And, you know, why don't you see what these animals are capable of? And they said, well, look, here, we'll make you a deal. Why don't you come out here for the summer and do some experiments, just behavioral experiments to see whether these animals are exhibiting the behavioral features that you want. And then if they, if they are, then clearly the brain's got to be supporting it. You can go back to the brain. So I thought about this and I thought, well, these guys don't know what they're talking about. But if I come out and demonstrate that these rodents cannot do this behavior that I'm interested in, this will actually be really important because this will justify my studying this behavior exclusively in non-human primates. And certainly when you're working with that model system, it's really important to justify why that's the right model system to answer the particular scientific question that you're asking. Those animals are very precious and you wanna make sure that it's a question that's, that's worthy of using that model system. So I thought, well, I'm gonna just go, um, I'm gonna go and prove those guys, prove those guys wrong. But then I realized I can't, I have two little kids. Like I can't just leave my kids for like three months and go to Cold Spring Harbor. So I told them this and they said, well, we have a daycare. So I got on the plane with my kids and we flew across the country and I signed them up and I put them in the daycare and they were reasonably happy. And I went into the lab and started to test, uh, test the rodents and see how they did on this, this particular kind of decision-making task I was interested in. And they were great. They did great. The animals totally surpassed my expectations for what they were able to, able to do in terms of um, in terms of the behavior. And so I went back to Seattle after three months, kind of not knowing what to think. I'd had this life plan that I had been, you know, I'm, I told you guys I'm super focused. I made this plan like at the beginning of my postdoc five years later, I was ready to carry out this plan to open a primate lab. But I realized that my plan wasn't working. And that maybe there was another option that might be a better option. So I started to consider this um, and Cold Spring Harbor was potentially interested in hiring me. So that was a big plus. And, but there were a lot of downsides. My, my partner at the time didn't want to move to New York. He said, I'll move anywhere in the world except New York and New Jersey. Um, so that was kind of a downside. The people in my lab were really negative on this idea. They're like, and you're crazy. These rats are so dumb. <laughs> You know, they're never going to do what you want. Besides, you think you're going to like compete with all those like circuit cracking people that are like doing, you know, optogenetics, which was kind of new at the time. You think you're going to compete with them? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I can't compete with them. And the truth is, I realized that I didn't know if they were right or wrong or whether the naysayers were right or wrong. But I realized that I didn't really have a better option. I had tried to get a job as a private person. It hadn't worked. I had another opportunity that was right in front of me and I decided to jump on it. So I went to SF, the Society for Neuroscience meeting that year and I kind of like came out as a rodent researcher. Um, and I told people, yeah, I decided I'm leaving primates. I'm gonna go on the job market to get a job starting a rodent lab. Um, people were uniformly negative. <laughs> 
<laughs> and really negative things or else they just laughed. Um, uh, but, you know, I kind of knew it was the right decision. And I also kind of knew that I didn't really have that much of a choice. So I went back on the job market as a rodent person. Um, that was started a whole other set of challenges because people um, quite rightly didn't think I'd be able or didn't have confidence I'd be able to start a lab. Um, I had originally pro proposed to study multisensory integration in primates, um, and I hadn't had any experience with multisensory integration, but at least I did with primates. So now I was proposing to open a lab um, studying multisensory integration in rodents, having no experience in either multisensory integration or rodents, uh, which was a pretty risky uh, research proposal. Um, and I, you know, up until then, I was a really, really risk averse person. I think something happened to my brain in about the spring of 2009 that really changed my perspective um, on things. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I was really lucky that um, the Cold Spring Harbor was uh, willing to take a risk on me and, and make me a job offer, despite the fact that I had a pretty, um, pretty risky research proposal. So I was really, really grateful to them for doing that, and also to um, to Tony Zader, who's the person that who's the chair at the time. Um, who really spearheaded uh, that effort to bring me to Cold Spring Harbor. So when I left uh, Seattle, it was kind of like a funeral march. Um, my lab was like, Anne, what are you thinking? There was another postdoc in the lab. So at this, so you know, I signed the letter, I go to Cold Spring Harbor, everyone was kind of like, oh God. Another postdoc in the lab got an interview, we threw him a party. So <laughs> he had an interview as a primate person, he got a party. I got sort of a, a mediocre uh, uh, a smile, I guess. Um, uh, I told my friends and they said, oh, you have to leave Seattle to go to New York. How awful. You know, I can't imagine how terrible the job market must be. And I'm like, guys, like New York is it's kind of a great place. <laughs> so, and my partner still didn't want to go. So it was like every single person I talked to was telling me what a horrible decision this was. Um, but I got on the plane and I flew here. And I remember my first night here, I was staying in some kind of temporary housing and I remember walking alone along the main road that runs through Cold Spring Harbor. It's called Bungtown Road, some of you may know, and just feeling this sense of euphoria that I had done something that everybody else thought was a terrible idea, but that um, that I knew it was that I knew it was the right thing to do. Um, so it was a really exciting time. It was it, uh, it, it was challenging to start a lab. It kind of like your mind was kind of exploding for quite a long time. Um, I think one of the things that made it sort of more challenging was the fact that I still had two pretty little kids to take care of. But actually, at that moment, there was a real flip side to that, which is as follows. So because I had just, they, when I moved, they had just turned four and six. So I spent the last four, uh, sorry, six years um, being a person that had to think of, uh, of these small creatures and how I was going to nurture them and bring out their, um, you know, their best qualities and figure out how to care for every aspect of them when I was and wasn't there. So then I came to Cold Spring Harbor and my, and my like second day on the job, I'm like, you know, calling to interview technicians, putting up ads for postdocs, figuring out how to order equipment, build, figuring out how to build a lab. And I was like, oh, this is what I do. <laughs> This is like a big multifaceted problem with a lot of complex organizational aspects and this small nascent thing that needs to be nurtured so it can grow. Bring it on. Like that's I'm awesome at that. And so I, it was a great moment for me because I think in we, we hear a lot and, and there is some truth to this that in, in some ways that parenting and being a scientist are really kind of at odds with each other. And sometimes they are right. There's moments when when both of those important things need your time and there's only one of you. But there are also ways in which they're so complimentary. And my experience being a parent to two small kids so well prepared me for running a lab in so many ways. And so even though I felt like my head was exploding like all the time that first year, I felt like, like I, I got this, like I can do this job. And it was overall a great experience. There were some funny things. Um, one thing that was a challenge for people at Cold Spring Harbor was for them to learn that actually I was a scientist at the lab. So, so for instance, um, uh, I have my own parking spot here, and it says, you know, Dr. Churchland on it. And I, you know, went and parked there one day, and, and a very nice um, uh, a man from facilities came and said, "Look, I have to tell you this. You know, you can't park there. Those, those spots are for the scientists." And I'm like, "No, I am." A scientist. <laughs> that's me that's my name churchland and he said oh i'm so sorry i you know i see you out here with um with your kids so i thought you know it was your husband's lab and you're not really supposed to park there i was like that's okay 
and he met well, you know, he was actually a really nice guy. We have a very nice rapport. Another another person with whom I had a nice rapport uh, was a, a very senior person here, in, not in neuroscience, in a different group. And I, um, I asked him at one point, you know, whether he'd be willing to look at a draft of my R01. And he was outside of my area of expertise, um, which is why he didn't know me very well. And I, I thought this would be a strength, right? Because I wanted like to get an outside perspective kind of. So I, I you know, wrote to him and I brought him the, the R01 and he was like, oh, oh, sure, sure. I, I'd be happy to read it. And I said, oh, okay, great. I mean, you look a little surprised. Are you sure this is okay? And he's like, oh, no, I just, I thought you were a nanny. I didn't realize you worked here at the lab. But, you know, because I've seen you with the kids and stuff. And I was like, oh, no, no, I'm not a nanny here. I'm a principal investigator. And he was like, okay, I'll read the, I'll read the R01. Now, to his credit, he read the R01. He gave me very useful comments. And the R01 was funded. So I, um, it, it wasn't a great comment, but that, you know, maybe it worked out, worked out in the end. Um, so, so overall, I think my experience being a PI has been, um, has been pretty good. I think I had to really, uh, I, I had to learn to kind of broaden my focus a bit and to be able to step away from being so laser focused that I couldn't see the big picture and to learn how to see the big picture. And um, my inability to do that, uh, I think, you know, cost me a couple of grants and, and maybe some papers. I think people thought I was sort of too narrowly focused and detail oriented and I learned how to, um, need to, to learn how to step out of that. Um, but, but I did and I think um, one thing that was, I think, important there is, is we have a tendency to think that these particular qualities that we have are very fixed. Um, and my natural tendency is to be like a laser focused person. But in fact, when I compare how I did as a laser focused graduate student versus a, like a big vision PI, I think I'm actually better at this. I think I love having a big vision. I love like meeting with each of the people in my lab and hearing what they're working on and thinking about how all these different pieces fit into this much bigger research program that we have and these big questions about the brain that we're trying to understand. So I think we, when, when you find a personal, particular shortcoming that you might be experiencing, remember that they're not fixed and we can learn. And, and sometimes the, um, what seems like our, our biggest challenge ultimately can become a, a, a great strength if we recognize that it needs to be addressed and try to figure out how we can do better and kind of face the sometimes painful realities of the things that, um, that, we, aren't very, uh, that we aren't very good at. Um, so I don't want to go on for um, for too long. I guess I'll just say say one kind of last thing. Um, I ended up having um, some, some kind of major additional challenges along the way that I won't go into too much detail. But one thing that happened to me about five years ago is that I kind of overnight suddenly found myself being the full time only parent of both of my kids. Some kind of really difficult stuff happened in my family and I took over as the single parent, um, just me and my kids by myself. And uh, it was a really big change and a really challenging time. Um, and I'm, I'm mentioning it not so much because uh, I think that, that you are likely to face that challenge yourself. There actually aren't too many single moms in academia, so probably you probably won't face that particular challenge. But I bring it up instead because I think that sometimes when we, when we look at people in the field who have uh, made it to the level of being a PI, for example, it can really seem that they have these kind of picture perfect lives. And especially because of the way that people portray themselves, really including me, on, you know, on social media and so on, that we can make it, it, it can really seem as if everybody has these kind of perfect, um, flawless lives and that everybody has, you know, this, this amazing partner that's like really supporting them at every stage of the way. Um, but the truth is that people have all kinds of like big shit going on. And if you find yourself in that position, it's okay. There's a lot of people there that make it and are able to keep doing science, even though they don't have that picture perfect existence, whether it comes to their children or their parents or their partner. Um, and so, you know, if you are experienced that or have experienced that, know that you're not alone, that there are a lot of people out there that have faced um, big challenges uh, and also people that, um, that, that paint a picture perfect life of, of what their reality is. Um, when in fact, if you scratch beneath the surface, 
you know, there are really some big kind of difficulties there as well. Um, so uh, I think I think part of why this happens is people feel like they don't really they don't feel comfortable sharing what's unique about their particular situation, especially when those challenges have to do with their partner or their family or any kind of mental health situation. So I think um, hopefully uh, this this mechanism of growing up in science is a way for people to start to um, to start to be open and talk about the challenges that they faced um, when they're when they're comfortable to do that. Um, so I think the final challenge I'm facing is, um, uh, is this pandemic. I think this has been a really big challenge. I'm really impressed um, at the organizers of this meeting who have the bandwidth to put together such an, um, such an amazing event. I found myself really limited in bandwidth and really kind of struggled with that. I feel like the, the thinking part of my brain that I really like makes much rarer appearances these days than it did six months ago. So I hope one day that part of me will come back. Um, so I think I'll stop there and uh, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that people have. Wow, <clears throat> that is fantastic. Unfortunately, I'm the only one that you're able to see and hear clapping, but <laughs> there are a number of comments uh, in the chat window. Um, really, to the both of you, just so grateful for the openness and talking about this and, and praising your storytelling ability. Um, and I have to say, you know, the, uh, the latent anger that I hear or that I feel at some of the, the stories that you described, like, unless Cold Spring Harbor is such an amazing place that the nannies are writing R01s, <laughs> like, there are some Bayesian priors that are so messed up in that interaction. It's just infuriating. Um, thank you both. There are a lot of really great questions. Um, some are overlapping a bit. If you don't mind, um, I might uh, kind of pick and choose here. Um, and maybe combine a few questions together. I think the one that bubbled to the top is um, after you've had a negative interaction with someone, especially someone who is powerful and, and maybe a scientist in your field, um, and I think you both described interactions that at a minimum I think could be described as tense, um, how long after that did you feel comfortable um, actually talking about it publicly. Can, am I back? Either way, feel free to jump in and answer here. Uh, can we hear, can, can you hear me now? All right, okay. I can. Yeah, um, yeah uh, and it was amazing to hear your story again, even though I had uh, heard, heard it before. Um, so uh, I actually uh, wrote publicly about my, the bad experiences with my first PhD advisor shortly after I got my PhD. It was a bad idea. We had a bad falling out and we're no longer on, on speaking terms. I'm still in, on good terms with my second PhD advisor. Um, but what I often see in, in these um, growing up in science stories is that people are quite careful about uh, speaking publicly about um, negative interactions. And that's completely understandable um, because uh, like the power dynamics in, in academia is really weird that uh, you are really dependent on recommendation letters until very late in your career. And, and that means that if you had bad experiences with your mentor, you uh, uh, that is the same person who can make or break your career. So that's, uh, that, that is a very unhealthy situation. And, and in some cases, um, trainees break out of that. So I've, for example, written uh, recommendation letters for students to explain why they didn't get a recommendation letter from their main advisor. I think many, many uh, PIs uh, have been in that situation. Um, but um, more generally, I think that the, 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 the mechanisms are not in place uh, to protect trainees. And many people are trying to do something about that, but it's, it's hard because uh, like the power dynamics are very much ingrained. That um, it's almost like a feudal system where the PI is uh, it is like uh, has complete control, and uh, you just have to hope that they're benevolent, right? And if, if things go uh, uh, sideways, then uh, you only have to, you can only hope that there will be other people in your broader community that you can appeal to, like a PhD committee or a chair uh, or an ombudsperson. Uh, but very often, those mechanisms are not in place, or it's just too intimidating for students to speak out. So, I think that. Uh, apart from speaking out publicly, just speaking out about uh, bad situations that you're in right now, uh, I think we all have to work harder to create mechanisms to make that easier. And uh, students um, 
can in some cases just uh, um, talk to trusted people in their departments. Um, but yeah, we still have a lo long, long way to go there. And did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, I, th I agree with I agree with Luigi. Okay. Um, speaking of that, when it's difficult maybe to talk publicly about some of these things, another question that we got, and this is maybe more directed to you, Weiji, about growing up in science. You know, there are graduate students that are really find this sort of event valuable and are proposing to their faculty that they run such a seminar. Um, however, one finds little enthusiasm for this from faculty. How do you persuade folks to actually come up and give these talks? I have to say, uh, having organized this event, I can answer for myself. Um, when you go to the person who originated the series and to a strong scientist who is known for her advocacy and mentorship um, in the community, it's very easy. They say yes at the drop of a hat as soon as you ask them. Unfortunately, uh, I think I had a very biased sample here. And of course, um, you know, many, many faculty are not as comfortable getting up and talking about these yeah. sort of things. Yeah. Of course, I'm joking a little bit um, at how easy it was to organize this event um, because the two of you are so fantastic. So, Wade, at the places that have started this outside of NYU um, or maybe even within NYU, how do you suggest that people get some buy-in and, and get faculty come up and start telling their stories like this? So uh, personally at NYU, I haven't had any trouble finding uh, speakers. Uh, almost everybody has said yes. Um, a, a few people did feel that it was, uh, that, that they were too private to, to share. Um, but um, I've also uh, generally, uh, uh, especially in the early years, picked people who I thought would be open and honest and had an interesting story to tell. Um, I think that in other places that have started a series like this, um, students have uh, followed very similar um, uh, models, right? It, it's actually often students and postdocs who start these series, not faculty. But then they might find a, a faculty member who's very sympathetic and supportive. That definitely helps, if only if, with practical details, um, like uh, dissemination of, of, of announcements, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, very often it's student-driven. Um, and uh, students and postdocs, they, they often know who to, who, to, who to choose. If your own department is relatively small, consider branching out, making it broader across multiple departments, right? There's several places that uh, include multiple departments. And uh, typically I advise to have sort of a rotation where over the lifetime of a PhD student, like five years, you are able to have a full cycle of, of faculty. Um, and um, if you want any uh, suggestions for how to uh, set up a series, as I said, I'm, I'm always happy to help. Great. Well, thank you for the advice. I know I'm thinking about starting this sort of series at my own institution, and it sounds like um, many students in the chat are really finding it very valuable. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here and combine a couple of questions um, together. Um, and maybe this um, can get fielded uh, first to, to Anne, given the, the stories that you told about your job search. So there are a number of questions about um, kind of approaching the job search coming off of some difficulty. Um, you know, uh, people mention a few different types of things, um, like coming out of a toxic environment. Um, uh, perhaps a pirate nutcracker has invaded your life and you're not sure what to do about it. Um, no, uh, people mentioning, you know, coming out of toxic environments in their PhD, um, maybe uh, someone else pointed to some research by Aaron Closet and company showing that um, the majority of tenure track faculty positions um, are attained by people coming from just a small set of universities. So perhaps you're coming from a university that's not one of those that's known for, um, for placing people in tenure track positions. And I'll just add maybe another um, aspect to this. Of course, a lot of people are concerned about, um, about the economic environment now and the effect it's going to have on the job search over the next couple of years, um, which I think Anne and I were both on the job market the first time about the same time around the recession of 2008. 
So just kind of generally, um, when you have challenges like coming from a toxic environment or a university or mentor without the reputation or the professional network or a bad economic situation, um, do you have any advice for people who are um, who are approaching the job market with those sort of challenges and trying to figure out how to confidently navigate it? Um, yeah, I think that is really challenging. Uh, and I, I, I worry about the, the current environment given the economic challenges of COVID. Um, I think probably a lot of you are familiar with many of the, the advice that exists already and stuff like networking and so on. But I think, I guess from my personal perspective, the one thing that really helped me when I was really like flailing on the job market was to change my strategy. And I'm not necessarily advocating for switching model system at the 11th hour. I think I was really lucky that that particular switch happened to work for me. But I think um, I had a really specific and kind of narrow vision of what I wanted my science to be. And it wasn't a bad vision. Like it would have been okay if I had done that. But in fact, by kind of being open to some different options, I ended up finding something that I think was way better and allowed me to do a very different kind of science than I thought that I would do, but one that I really, really like a lot. So I think be open to, you know, to the extent that you can, be open to different possibilities um, of what your future might look like. Um, and, uh, and and hopefully exciting things will come your way. And, and, and I wish you all sort of luck and perseverance. I know this is a really tough time um, to be a postdoc, especially with all this uncertainty. So best of luck to everybody. Great. Thank you. I think um, maybe a very related question that's bubbled up in the voting here, um, especially when you feel open to maybe changing your directions um, to try and find some success, um, it can be very intimidating to try and find those new problems. So there's a question here, how did you decide on research questions to tackle early on in your career? especially from something outside your field or switching fields. So this person says that they're a physicist themselves and struggling to find quantifiable problems to get their career started, presumably making the switch to neuroscience, much like Wei Ji did. So would either one of you comment on, um, on any advice about how to find those kind of initial questions um, when you're making a switch like this to get your career um, your research career kind of jump started. Yeah, I can give it give, give that a um, try. So um, I would um, I, I always sort of followed my nose. So I, I I didn't say do the obvious thing that physicists would do who switch to computational neuroscience. So there are lots of physicists who uh, stay relatively close to 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 physics. So they uh, do dynamical systems or or neural networks. So and that, that's where the physics expertise comes in quite immediately uh, useful. Um, and that's great, but uh, that never primarily um, appealed to me. So I uh, turned out to be super interested in quantitative modeling of behavior. So uh, whether you call it computational neuroscience is a, is a separate question, but maybe it's more cognitive science. But uh, starting with that paper that I mentioned with Patrick Wilkin, I, I felt that that's really what appeals to me. People try to talk me into doing fMRI, but I, I resisted that, and I don't think I regret it uh, resisting that. That uh, I, I don't feel that I should have be become an fMRI um, researcher. Um, so yeah, I, I think I've always been sort of happy-go-lucky. I follow my nose. I do what I study. What I find interesting. Uh, and around 2012, I started this new direction in my lab on. Um, how humans plan in sequential decisions, and it was actually inspired by my own uh, uh, like um, uh, a, a like of board games or addiction of to board games. Um, but it, it turned out to have much broader implications. Like planning is, of course, much much bigger than that. Um, but yeah, so I I think that life is too short and the scientific career is too short to be studying things that don't like viscerally appeal to you. I, 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 uh, that, that's that's probably not very good advice, but it's how I've lived my life. Great, thank you, Weiji. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of our time. I would like just to ask one more question that I think is really important here that has bubbled up. Um, and I think given what you've described, either one of you could take a stab at answering this. 
What advice would you give to postdocs who are in a toxic environment, but they're in the middle of a project and they don't want to leave the lab before finishing projects or publishing papers? Any insight on a situation like that? Well, I think if you're really in that situation and, and you feel that there's nothing you can do to change it, which I think is maybe the definition of a toxic environment, I think that means you've tried to talk to the PI and so on and it isn't working. Um, and if you've, if you've tried everything you can to change it and you really can't leave the lab, I think what you're kind of stuck with is coping. Um, and this is kind of, I guess those are kind of the things that I was trying to highlight um, before. Things like being able to take a step outside of science. Maybe for a while things are really bad. So you're not in that mode where you leave the lab and dream about science all night. You're in the mode where you leave the lab and you go to your Zumba class and then you go home and you know make sourdough from scratch and you just do stuff to take your mind off it and, and rely on the support networks that you have. Because um, when one is in a really toxic environment and can't leave, um, it's really tough. I think you, you have to, to see if um, the coping stru coping strategies can help you get through it. And so to the people struggling with that, I'm really sorry that you found yourself in that situation and um, and hang in there. And I hope there are brighter, brighter days ahead for you. Yeah, maybe one small thing to add that um, I, 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 I still am surprised that uh, how little um, incoming grad students and incoming postdocs sometimes um, consider the social environment of a lab and the uh, personal rapport with the advisor, right? So the, uh, the the science, of course, is important, but for your personal happiness, you really want to make sure to uh, um, that there is uh, like a supportive social environment, that your advisor is not a psycho. And uh, of course that's sometimes hard to judge personally but you have to listen to the gossip right so if somebody warns you even if it's if it's sort of in between the lines listen and don't join a lab like that don't think that i'll, I'll be the one person who can deal with this this difficult mentor I, i've seen many many uh, people um become miserable that way absolutely i just from my own experience can second the important uh, uh, the importance of kind of a support system, um, even outside, maybe especially outside the lab or outside a scientific environment. I think Anne mentioned this in her answer, but also in her story earlier. I know in my own experience, I wasn't in a toxic environment, but I was wallowing in my own inability to succeed during my PhD. And without the support system that I had of friends who were outside of that environment and could reaffirm the value that I had, as a person, apart from my value as a scientist, where I wasn't showing a lot of value at the time, it was just immensely important to me. So thank you guys for those comments, um, Ann and Weiji. Thank you for all the great questions from the audience. Um, I, I really appreciate the time today. I have to say that I have such admiration for the two of you as scientists, um, but even more just as people who not just in this session, but who I've seen willing to talk about these hard issues. Um, I, I just, I, I'm so appreciative. So on behalf of the organizers, but even just, uh, just wanna say a personal thank you um, for giving up an hour and a half of your time here to, to come out and tell these stories because it's, it is, um, it is life giving to me. And if it is to me, then I just can't even imagine um, how it is for people at all different career stages who don't necessarily um, have the tangible evidence in their hand yet of the success that they're going to have in their careers and the happiness that they're going to find in it. So just thank you so, so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you all um, for joining us in the audience and listening in and for the great questions. I wish we could get to more, but wish you all good luck and Godspeed. Um, and hope you have fun at the socials later. Ann and Weiji, any last words uh, before we depart? Thanks for organizing. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, hope this is starting more discussions. Thank yeah. Thanks so much to the organizers and to everyone in the audience. And um, I wish you many exciting discoveries in the future. And uh, hang in there with your struggles. And I uh, hope you get through them. Awesome. Thank you both. Have a good night, everyone. Head Bye. over to the socials. Starting now.